Now we'll hear from senior officials from the FDA, CDC, and the Department of Health and Human Services as they review plans to prepare for and respond to pandemics. This is about two hours. I'd like to call this hearing to order the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. This, mo this morning, uh, we're holding a hearing titled Facing the 21st Century Public Health Threats, Our Nation's Preparedness and Response Capabilities. Uh, we'll hear from Dr. Robert Cadlick, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Stephen Redd, uh, Director of the Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and Dr. Scott Gottlieb, Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. This is the first of two hearings we plan to have on this topic. The second will be noticed uh, for Tuesday, January 23rd. Sen Senator Murray and I each have an opening statement uh, then I'm going to turn to Senator uh, Alexander and Senator Casey for any opening remarks they might have. After that, we'll introduce our panel of witnesses and hear their testimonies. And then each member will have up to five minutes for any remarks and questions. First, I'd like to welcome uh, the chairman and thank him for giving me the opportunity to hold the gavel today. This hearing discusses a topic that's critical to our national security and has seen many years of bipartisan work in this committee and in this Congress. Together, we have developed and strengthened the framework to ensure we're prepared for chemical, biologic, radiological, and other nuclear threats with the potential to jeopardize the health of all Americans. The Pandemic and All Hazard Preparedness Act of 2006 created a framework which has grown and changed as we've learned from each public health experience we've been through. We should be proud of the accomplishments under PAPA and the progress made over the last decade. Our work has resulted in strong partnerships with our states and local counterparts, created greater certainty and accountability to bring forward medical, uh, forward medical countermeasures and established a clear strategy with which we can combat the full range of public health threats we face today and those we may encounter in the future. Despite this progress, we're not fully prepared and more work remains to accomplish our goal. The Blue Ribbon Study Panel on Biodefense stated in their 2015 report that there are, and I quote, serious gaps and inadequacies that continue to leave the nation vulnerable to threats from nature and terrorists alike, unquote. As we move forward in revisiting this successful and bipartisan law, I want to make it very clear to my colleagues that, that this is reauthorization of a national security bill. And I look forward to working with each of you on this important issue. The threats we face continue to evolve. And it's critical that we bring with this discussion the vigilance, urgency, and resolve this mission demands. We are in an, in an unprecedented era of te technological and biomedical innovation and advancement. In November 2016, the President's Advisory Council on Science and Technology warned that, and I quote, while the ongoing growth of biotechnology is a great boon for society, it also holds serious potential for destruction, destructive use by both states and technically competent individuals, unquote. And I urge the U.S. government's past ways of thinking and organizing to meet biological threats. Uh, the th threat needs to change to reflect and address this rapidly developing landscape. For this reason, it's critical that fostering and advancing innovation, particularly in the development of medical countermeasures, is top of mind and that we work through this reauthorization process to ensure CDC, FDA, Asper Barta have what they need to keep pace with these rapidly changing and evolving threats. This committee has worked to push the federal government and HSS, HHS in particular to meet these challenges. An HHS that fosters innovation in the development of medical countermeasures and across PAPA's framework provides the greatest hope to ensure the safety of the American people. 
the witnesses we have before us today will be able to provide insight into the urgency of this mission and the promise innovation holds if properly leveraged. I look forward to hearing from each of you about the progress that we've made and where we can continue to improve policies and programs to realize their full potential to save Americans' lives. Now I'd like to turn to uh, Senator Murray for any comments she might have. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to all of you for joining this hearing on our nation's preparedness to combat public health threats as we look towards now reauthorizing the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act later this year. And I especially want to thank um, Senator Casey and Senator Burr uh, for their bipartisan work and leadership on this really important issue. Local Washington State papers show why today's discussion is so important to families across this country. We have headlines like flu deaths and cases increasing in Pierce County and flu outbreak in Snohomish County kills five, 50 hospitalized. A bad flu season can be a nightmare for families and too often ends in horrible tragedy. Just as we must continue to improve our public health response across the board to prevent those tragedies on the local level, we have to also make sure we are vigilant against pandemics of a global scale. A pandemic could affect half a billion people, more than the entire population of the United States. And that's not speculation. It happened 100 years ago. The 1918 influenza epidemic was a tragedy more deadly to the human race than World War I. And today, the threat of pandemic flu is joined by new threats. So what have we learned in the last century? Are we better prepared for the next catastrophe? When you consider Ebola and how the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and so many partners supported Nigeria as they instituted evidence-based policies and tracked the path of that disease and contained it when the outbreak reached Lagos? The answer is clearly yes. When you consider our strategic national stockpile, which can deliver 50 tons of emergency medical supplies anywhere in the U.S. in 12 hours, the answer is clearly yes. When you consider the FDA's approval of new medical countermeasures to combat anthrax and flu and radiation and plague, the answer is clearly yes. However, our track rev record is far from perfect. We still can do better. We can do better than the President's way too slow response in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands after Hurricane Maria. The storm left many Americans without access to clean water and electricity and health care for months. We can do better than the administration's response to the opioid epidemic. President Trump declared the crisis a public health emergency 83 days ago and has taken little meaningful action since. So I'm glad this committee will continue its bipartisan work to address the opioid crisis in another hearing soon. We can also do better than our slow response in improving funding to combat Zika in 2016. The World Health Organization declared Zika a global health emergency in February. Instead of a fast response with needed funding, the response got politicized around some Republicans who pushed to determine, undermine women's health care and access to contraception, which was a key requirement to prevent the virus from causing devastating birth defects. As a result, that took Congress nine months to pass emergency funding for a public health crisis that endangered mothers and babies and families across the world. That delay hurt people and it harmed families in ways they're going to carry for the rest of their lives. So we have to do better. We are most successful at protecting our families against pandemic threats when we respond with quick, bipartisan action. We need decisions based in science and expert medical opinion, not ideology, especially when it comes to women's health. We need federal, state, and local agencies to hire the people and capacity and have the funding they need to protect communities. Hiring freezes and funding cuts make us less prepared, not more. We need to plan for everyone. We can't overlook the young or the elderly. We can't forget pregnant women or individuals with disabilities or those fighting chronic diseases like diabetes. We need innovative medical countermeasures to protect us from today's threats like a universal flu vaccine and antibiotics to combat resistant bacteria. And we must continue strong partnerships with industry that will allow us to rapidly respond to new threats. We need to stop fear and uncertainty before they create panic by getting families helpful and accurate information from sources that they trust. We can't allow anyone to undermine the science of proven solutions like vaccines. 
We need to respond to global health crises abroad before they travel here to home. Diseases are not stopped by borders or walls or bans. This is a place where the United States can and should lead. We should continue to show our international partners that we are focused on these issues and will be their ally in preparing for and addressing public health threats. Congress has a strong bipartisan track record of addressing these challenges through the PAPA, which strengthened our nation's public health preparedness and created new roles and programs and authorities for public health emergency response. Reauthorizing the act in 2013, we built on that record and enhanced medical surge capacity. We modernized biosurveillance cap capabilities and increased our focus on at-risk individuals. I'm hopeful we can continue that progress with legislation that focuses on the science and evidence-based policies we know, know work to mitigate public health crisis, that considers the needs of everyone and puts families and women before politics, supports state and lo local public health officials, ensures communities don't spend months waiting for needed emergency resources, and enables us to respond to the next crisis with foresight rather than learn from the next tragedy with hindsight. We don't know what the next public health threat will be. We don't know where or when or even how it'll start. But we do know that being prepared starts now. All of you here today have a critical role to play in keeping our communities healthy and safe. The Food and Drug Administration helps facilitate the development and review of medical countermeasures and grants emergency use authorizations for products that are needed on the front lines. The Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response guides our nation's preparedness planning. They help ensure our health care system is ready to face any emergency. And it invests in medical countermeasures pipeline through the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is on the front lines, supporting state and local public health departments, overseeing the national, uh, strategic national stockpile gathering and analyzing key data, and serving as a trusted source of information to the public. I'm interested to hear from all of you today about your work to fulfill these important roles and keep our country safe. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do want to say I am frustrated that Director Fitzgerald is once again unable to join us here today. Due to conflicts of interest presented by investments, our CDC director still has to recuse herself on some of the important health issues that we face including issues related to data collection and information sharing, which are very relevant to the conversation that we're having today. I'm concerned that she still can't give her full attention to all the pressing health threats we face and hope that these conflicts of interest will be resolved soon. Thank you, Dr. Redd, for joining us in her place, and I look forward to hearing from you and all of our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Murray. Uh, Senator Alexander. Thank you, Senator Burr. And Senator Burr, thank you for your willingness to chair this chair this hearing. Um, on March of 2013, President Obama signed into law the Bipartisan Pandemic and All-Hazard Preparedness Reauthorization Act. Senator Burr was the author of that reauthorization and the original legislation, which became law in 2006. He worked with many senators on this committee, uh, both Democratic and Republican, and I thank them all for that, Senator Murray, Senator Casey, and 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 others. Senator uh, Isaacson um, was another another of those. So Senator Burr is uh, chairing the hearing, and I thank him for that. Um, I would also like to uh, welcome Senator Smith from Minnesota, who is joining our, our committee, replacing Senator Franken, who was a valuable member of the committee. Senator Jones uh, from Alabama is also a new member of the committee. We welcome him. He replaced Senator Whitehead, who was a very valuable member of the committee, I mean White House, and who has taken a lesser assignment on the Finance Committee for some, for some reason. But we, we'll miss Sheldon and his, and his work on this committee. I'm going to, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to withhold my comments, although what I would like to do is call on Senator Isaacson for uh, one minute just to make some comments, and then we'll go to Senator Casey. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to, in reference to the statements made by the ranking member, Senator Murray, whom, whom I have talked to about Dr. Fitzgerald. I talked with Dr. Fitzgerald yesterday as chairman of the Ethics Committee. I have gotten her in touch with the appropriate people to deal with the issue. 
Uh, she is forthrightly dealing with it to the best I can determine, and I'm working to expeditiously see we get it done as quickly as possible so she will not have any conflict to testify whatsoever. And that's her desire as well. Thank you. Senator Casey. Thank you very much, Senator Burr. I'm grateful for this hearing, grateful to be working with you again on this reauthorization and uh, commend your work on this for many, many years. I also want to thank, of course, the Chairman, Chairman Alexander, and Ranking Member Murray uh, for this bipartisan hearing on the nation's preparedness and response capabilities in advance of the reauthorization of the Pandemic All Hazards and Response Act, um, known as PAPA. One, I'll give you one story, one brief story, but I think instructive about how important preparation is. This is a good example of preparedness uh, infrastructure that PAPA supports. In this case, uh, in the aftermath of a tragedy, a train derailment that occurred in Philadelphia in May of 2015. The train was carrying 238 passengers when it derailed eight people. Eight people lost their lives. Over 200 were injured in that derailment. Fortunately, through funding from PAPA's Hospital Preparedness Program, which we know by the acronym HPP, the Pennsylvania Department of Health and Regional Health Care uh, and a Regional Health Care Coalition had long been working together to prepare local health care systems for emergencies that could cause a surge in patients. When the train derailed, HPP-funded systems were tracking bed availability in local hospitals and providing that information in real time to emergency responders who were at the scene, helping them to effectively triage patients, send them to hospitals that had the capacity to accept additional patients so they could begin to receive the care they needed. Because these systems were in place before the train derailed, they were ready to protect uh, both health and to save lives when seconds, literally seconds, counted. Yet security, uh, health security threats are increasing in frequency and intensity due to a combination of factors including newly emerging infectious diseases, extreme weather events, and our aging infrastructure. So now more than ever, we must continue to build our nation's resiliency by investing in countermeasure development, surveillance, and supporting state and local partners to reduce the impact of health events in the country. So I'd like to thank today's witnesses for their service. It's important to mention your service to the country, as well as your commitment to protecting America's public health. We look forward to the hearing uh, and grateful for the work that we can do today at this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Casey, thank you, and thank you for your continued uh, help and work on this issue. Uh, let me just remind members that this is the start of the reauthorization of PAPA. Now, having been in Congress for 24 years, I realize that when you get involved in HHS legislation and FDA legislation, there is always a temptation to fix other things. I want to encourage you to fight the urge. Let's keep this focused on perfecting PAPA. It's been successful. We still have work to do. But if we become distracted and create a fight over changes within FDA that have nothing related to this or HHS or somewhere else because the, the, the sheer geography that just PAPA allows us to get into, we will lose the focus of what we're doing, and that's trying to make PAPA even more effective in the future. So with that, I'd like to introduce our witnesses, which will each have up to five minutes uh, to give their testimony. I'm pleased to welcome uh, today Dr. Robert Cadlick. Dr. Cadlick is the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at the Department of Health and Human Services. If he doesn't like the title, he was the one that created it. Uh, it was with Dr. Cadillac's help that we created the ASPR position as part of PAPA to establish a clear line of authority in the event of a public health emergency. The ASPR is the person at HHS solely responsible for leading and coordinating the federal medical and public health re preparedness and response effort across all the agencies within HHS, including FDA and CDC. Uh, Dr. Bob, delighted to have you back today. Paul. Next. Oh, sorry, sir. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Scott Gottlieb. 
Dr. Gottlieb is the commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. The FDA plays a critical role in our emergency preparedness and response capabilities through its review of medical countermeasures, including drugs, vaccine, diagnostic tests, and by ensuring these countermeasures are safe and effective. Further, the 2013 reauthorization of PAPA aimed to improve regulatory certainty and predictability for medical countermeasures under review at the FDA while also providing the agency with additional authorities to support rapid response to public health emergencies. Uh, Scott, we're delighted to have you here and delighted to have you in that position at FDA. Finally, uh, we'll hear from Dr. Stephen Redd. Dr. Redd is the director of the Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. CDC serves a number of roles under the PAPA framework and has built a strong relationship with state and local public health departments, an important aspect of preparing for and responding to emergency public health threats. CDC also works to make sure we have the information we need in advance of and during a public health emergency. As part of this effort, CDC houses an expansive epidemiology laboratory capacity and its responsibility for biosurveillance and public health data collection activities. Again, we welcome all of you. Let me just say at the beginning, um, I believe the hurdle that's in our way is not available innovation. I believe the hurdle that's in our way is government. Um, clearly defining what it is that our need is and the certainty of a pathway for getting the approvals that we need for those to actually be deployed. So I hope you'll keep those in mind as you go through not just your testimony, your questions, but more importantly, in the roles that you carry out after you leave, understand you're on the front lines at making this happen. Dr. Bob, floor is yours. Well, thank you, sir. Sorry for the false start there. I was excited to be here, sir. I was ready to go. Well, anyway, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, both of you, sirs, and uh, Senator Murray and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, I assumed this role five months ago, just a week before Hurricane Harvey struck Texas. Uh, it's been an interesting experience so far, and I have much to share from that experience. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today as you prepare to consider the second reauthorization of PAPA. Uh, this com committee championed the bipartisan effort to draft and pass this groundbreaking legislation. I want to thank you for continu your continuing commitment to this endeavor. I'm proud to have played a part in the original legislative process during my tenure with this committee and acknowledge the vision and leadership of Senator Burr and the late Senator Ted Kennedy. This morning I will share with you my perspective on the national security imperative of PAPA, the mission and duties of ASPR, and my visions for areas of improvement. The Constitution states that one of the federal government's fundamental obligations is to provide for the common defense, to protect the American people, our homeland, and our way of life. The strength of our nation's public health and medical infrastructure, as well as the capabilities to quickly mobilize a coordinated national response to pandemics, attacks, and disasters, are essential to save lives and protect all Americans. Therefore, improving national readiness and response capabilities for 21st century threats is a national security imperative, as Senator Burr outlined earlier, and is the crux of my effort at the, as the ASPR. The 21st century health security environment is increasingly complex and dangerous. It demands that we act with urgency. Having recently left my job with the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, I know these threats all too well. Terrorist organizations remain determined to attack the United States. State actors now directly threaten our homeland with nuclear weapons and have the means to employ both chemical and biological weapons. Further, we have witnessed the increased frequency of naturally occurring disasters as well as disease outbreaks and the currently monitoring potential emerging infectious diseases that could cause a pandemic, such as the H7N9 influ influenza strain circulating in China. The bottom line is, whatever happens, your constituents, the American people, expect our federal government to be ready to respond to save lives. When ASPR was originally established by PAPA a decade ago, the objective was to answer a simple question. Who's in charge of all federal public health and medical preparedness and response functions? The approach adopted was based on the Goldwater-Nichols Act that created the Unified Combatant Commands at the Department of Defense. ASPR's mission 
is to save lives and protect Americans from these threats by recruiting the entire weight of the federal medical and public health assets and recruit the support of the public health sector to support state and local activities and responses to help Americans in distress. As ASPR, I have four key priorities. First, provide strong leadership. Focus on coordination, planning, and preparing for events that threaten the national health security. Second, develop a national disaster health care system. Third, advocate for CDC sustainment of a robust and reliable public health security capabilities. And last, but certainly not least, advance an innovative medical countermeasure enterprise. Two areas of progress and opportunity I'll elaborate on are operational health care readiness capacity and the medical countermeasures enterprise. The importance of the national health care readiness and medical surge capacity was highlighted during this hurricane season. After Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria, ASPR led federal medical and public health response and recovery activities under the national response framework. We work closely with FEMA and state and territorial health officials to augment health care with HHS disaster medical assistance teams as well as VA and DOD assets. We learned from these disasters that ASPR needs to update its incident command and deployable medical capabilities as well as enhance our support for the health care infrastructure across the country. As with medical countermeasures, the nation's health care delivery infrastructure is mostly a private sector enterprise that must be effectively engaged in proving readiness. To address the potential catastrophic medical consequences of the 21st century threats, we need a tiered regional system that is based on existing local health care coalitions and trauma centers that integrates all medical response capabilities, including federal assets, as well as emergency medical services, the front line of our response capabilities. We must expand specialty care, expertise in trauma, behavioral health care, and chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear event, uh, response. And in certain and last but not least, incentivize the health care system to integrate measures of preparedness into daily standards of care. I call this the foundation of a national disaster health care system. The second area is our medical counterprise enterprise. And I'm grateful that uh, Dr. Rick Bright behind me, Rick, why don't you wave to the crowd, uh, who's the director of BARDA, is joining me today. Uh, BARDA is, was established as part of PAPA and is a component of ASPR to bridge the so-called valley of death in the late stage development of vaccine, drug, and diagnostic development when many products historically, historically languished or failed. By using flexible, nimble authorities, multi-year advanced funding, strong public-private partnerships, and cutting-edge expertise, BARDA has successfully pushed many innovative products through advanced development to stockpiling and FDA approval. To this date, 34 products have been approved by FDA uh, for the purposes of, of responding to disasters to the credit of Dr. Bright and his predecessor, Dr. Robin Robinson, and the team at BARDA. We have opportunities to further improve this enterprise by streamlining our internal decision-making processes, finding new ways to support innovation, promoting flexible, fast response capabilities, and increasing our collaboration with federal interagency partners. We also must work closely with our state and local partners as well as the private sector to enhance the capability to quickly distribute and dispense medical countermeasures in an emergency. In times of great challenge, we have the opportunity to build on the great progress made and further improve our national readiness and response capabilities. I look forward to working with you and your staff, and thank you again for your bipartisan support and commitment to national security. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Dr. Gottlieb. Senator Burr, Ranking Member Murray, and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify today. Our nation has faced many emerging public health challenges and unfortunately will face additional challenges in the future. Thankfully, our preparedness and the ability to respond to such challenges has improved greatly since the original enactment of the Pandemic All Hazards Preparedness Act. Each emergency is unique. Many are the result of emerging infectious threats. But the technology for manipulating science for diabolical purposes is becoming more ubiquitous and widely understood. So we face new and pervasive risks. 2017 was marked by the risks posed by several extreme natural disasters, which caused significant devastation and human suffering. These tragedies tested our nation's capabilities to respond. Today I'm going to focus my remarks on the impact of these storms on medical products manufactured in Puerto Rico and the actions we're taking to mitigate existing and potential product shortages. 
The impact of Hurricane Maria showed the importance of Puerto Rico to our medical product manufacturing base, as well as the intricate and sometimes fragile nature of that supply chain. I want to focus on the complexities of the saline shortage because it's stressed our system, and I know that many of you are deeply and rightly concerned by this situation. Saline solution has been in and out of shortage for several years. There are only a small number of primary manufacturers. So when one manufacturer lowers production, even for routine maintenance, there's stress on the entire system. One of the largest manufacturers of IV saline is Baxter, and their primary sites for small volume bags are located in Puerto Rico. These sites struggle to regain power and return to full capacity following the storm, and roads to some of the manufacturing plants were disabled. We work closely with Baxter in partnership with the Department of Homeland Securities and Puerto Rico authorities and Bob, so thank you for your support as well, to ensure that they were able to get back on the power grid on a priority basis to stabilize production. We also worked with various saline manufacturers to find other manufacturing facilities globally that could help supply the U.S. until Baxter's Puerto Rico location was back up and running and the shortage was addressed. To mitigate that shortage, we've worked with manufacturers on the importation of saline from locations in Ireland, Australia, Mexico, Canada, Germany, and most recently, Brazil. When we import from international facilities, generally the manufacturers adjust the distribution to send some product to the U.S., but there's no actual increase in the total global production of product. Baxter's manufacturing facilities in Puerto Rico are now stable and on the grid, although the power situation on the island is still fragile. We expect their return to normal production will improve the situation. Before the storms hit, in anticipation of the crisis, FDA also prioritized the approval of saline products by two manufacturers, Fresenius Cobby and Laboratories uh, and Griffles. Both should start production soon. And having these two additional manufacturers online will help increase the overall supply of saline produced and distributed in the U.S., but this shortage has also had ripple effects. In order to find workarounds for the filled saline bags that were in shortage, providers have put various mitigation strategies in place. One strategy has hospitals compounding product themselves, and this has caused an increased demand for empty IV bags. There have been signals indicating that this increased demand is putting pressure on the supply of empty IV bags. FDA is taking steps to address this situation and determine which manufacturers could potentially increase capacity if necessary. I've reached out to some of these medical device manufacturers personally to inquire about their capacity to increase production if demand for IV containers, containers continues to increase. The scope of the flu outbreak across the country has also added to the strain on this tight supply chain. The shortage and the impact of the crisis in Puerto Rico underscores the need to continuously elevate our preparedness. There are going to be lessons learned from this episode. Already we've made some key observations about our ability to detect device shortages since we lack authorities to require notification of device shortages, we've had to depend on manufacturers and distributors reaching out to FDA or had to seek them out proactively. Our work in the shortage situation is, comp is an example of how the FDA has reacted in response to emergency situations. At the same time, we continue to work hard to improve our regulatory clarity and predictability for the development of medical countermeasures. That's an essential component of our national preparedness strategy. Today, we released draft guidance on material threat medical countermeasure priority review vouchers, which explains how FDA is implementing the PRV program to incentivize the development of certain drug and biologic medical countermeasures. I look forward to working with Congress to continue to increase our readiness for emergencies and look forward to answering your questions today. Thanks, Scott. Dr. Redd? Senator Burr, Chairman Alexander, and Ranking Member Murray. I am Dr. Stephen Redd, the Director of the Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response at the Centers for Disease Control, and I'm pleased to be here to talk with you today about the role CDC plays in public health preparedness and response, including those responsibilities under the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Reauthorization Act. CDC is the common defense of the country against health threats. Our work to prepare and respond to health emergencies require that we build on our day-to-day -day work in two particular areas. Number one, our longstanding partnership with state and local health departments, and number two, our medical, scientific, and program expertise. I'll describe the three pillars of our defense strategy, science, surveillance, and service. 
First, CDC has a unique collection of scientific expertise that exists nowhere else in the world. We have the ability to identify agents causing illness, whether that illness uh, is the cause, caused by an infectious microbe or a chemical or radiation exposure. We're ready to respond to a broad range of threats, including diseases like Ebola, smallpox, and H7 and 9 influenza. CDC plays a key role in discovering new and emerging infectious diseases using advanced detection techniques to identify pathogens quickly and more accurately. Every year, laboratories from all over the world send hundreds of thousands of specimens to CDC for testing. The second pillar enabling CDC's common defense of the country is surveillance. Public health surveillance is the collection, analysis, and use of data to target public health prevention and response. It's basically making sure the best information is used to make the right decisions. Examples of this work um, include uh, what we do to track uh, influenza, the National Syndromic Surveillance System, and the global disease detection. Influenza is probably the greatest natural health threat we face. Influenza viruses change continuously and require vigilance to detect these changes. CDC provides support to every state, to several major cities, and to a number of ministries of health throughout the world to conduct influenza surveillance and laboratory work. With the National Syndromic Surveillance Program, CDC collects de-identified health information on causes of emergency room, urgent care, and hospital visits. We, along with state and local health departments, use the data in real time to detect abnormal situations requiring public health response. CDC's Global Disease Detection Operations Centers monitors 30 to 40 outbreaks every day across the globe, 24-7, and assesses the potential risk to the United States from these events. In addition to science and surveillance, service is the final pillar supporting CDC's common defense of the country. Let me focus on three particular programs. The Public Health Emergency Preparedness Program, the Strategic National Stockpile, and the City's Readiness Initiative. In each of these programs, the keys to success are the close collaboration between CDC and state and local public health departments and the connection of these programs to CDC's scientific expertise. The Public Health Emergency Preparedness Grants go to every state and support staff, enable exercises to test and validate capabilities, and pay for laboratory and communications equipment. The Strategic National Stockpile is a $7 billion repository of pharmaceuticals, medical supplies, and medical equipment that's avail available for rapid delivery to support responses to health emergencies. The city's readiness initiative enhances preparedness in the nation's 72 largest cities where nearly 60% of the U.S. population resides. These funds are used to develop, test, and maintain plans to receive countermeasures from CDC's strategic national stockpile and rapidly dispense them. I'd like to leave the committee with three primary points about CDC's role in public health emergency preparedness and response. First, CDC is the common defense of the country against health threats. Two, CDC's preparedness work is built on a day-to-day -day foundation of our broad and deep scientific, medical, and program expertise. And three, CDC's longstanding partnerships with state and local health authorities are essential. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Dr. Redd, thank you very much, and you won the award for uh, getting the closest to the five minutes of uh, all our witnesses today. Um, chair would recognize himself and in, in the ranking member, and then Senator Alexander, Senator Casey, and then members in the order of attendance to today's hearing. Um, Dr. Bob, my first question is simple. Are we prepared for public health threats we face? Uh, sir, I'd have to say um, equivocally for some, but not all. Um, I think the reality is, is when this uh, concept of PAPA first came up in 2005, we had witnessed uh, the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Uh, we were anticipating potentially a pandemic, 
and we had just kind of experienced Katrina, but those are all kind of uh, in the rearview mirror in terms of the threats that we are prepared to deal with. Uh, quite frankly, uh, if you had to look at a nation state threat that we're considering today or multiple nation states that willing or are willing to use uh, terrible weapons against us, uh, both uh, physical as well as potentially cyber, uh, I think we're not prepared. Uh, and quite frankly, those are the things that keep me up at night as well as a pandemic uh, that could emerge again uh, from Asia, um, as well as the risks that come up that uh, Dr. Gottlieb identified with synthetic biology tools now that uh, allow nefarious people to do unimaginable things potentially. Uh, so I think we have a long way to go. Uh, we've done very well in some areas. Uh, again, a compliment to the to the effort that was done by the federal government in support of state and local authorities. And again, for those three hurricanes nearly consecutively, um, I think that was a, a great uh, commitment of, of effort by everyone, but uh, there's no time to rest on our laurels in that respect. The statute's very clear on BARDA's specific and targeted medical countermeasure mission to ensure that BARDA's staying focused and bringing forward the countermeasures we need to protect the American people from a range of chemical, biologic, radiological, and nuclear threats. All of BARTA's work should be tied to this threat context. Why is it important that BARTA's mission not be diluted by matters or mandates that would require BARTA to work on areas outside of those tied to the th threat specifically? And how does the comment of 34 innovations out of BARTA relate to uh, focus on its mission? Yes, sir. Well, I think the key thing here is remember what the mission was originally. And again, BARDA was only part of the puzzle here. Uh, Project BioShield, which was a 10-year advanced appropriation, was another critical element of that formula of success, which was a guaranteed market to manufacturers should they get to cross the finish line. But the key issue that you've raised, sir, is uh, that uh, we can't boil the ocean. Uh, quite frankly, uh, the BARTA model works. The resources that have been given to BARTA to date have been somewhat limited. Uh, we've had literally in some circumstances to rob Peter to pay Paul, given events as of, that have transpired with Ebola and other events. Uh, we don't have a sustained level of funding, uh, necessarily a line item for pandemic influenza, for example, uh, that would give us great confidence that we would have a sustained unter uninterrupted uh, funding stream. So the answer is, is arguably you could do more things, but the answer is you can't do more things with limited resources. And if we focus on the national security mission, which I think is vital, again, vital to the role of BARDA, um, then I think we have to stick to our lane. And, and right now, to use a defense analogy, we're operating with about a half an aircraft carrier uh, of resources to basically do this mission a national security mission to basically protect 320 million people. Um, and that's a challenge. Dr. Gottlieb, uh, in your experience, what's working well in the agency's review of medical countermeasures and what challenges have you seen in the med medical uh, countermeasure pipeline? Uh, I think we're doing a much better job now. And, you know, I look at this over a 15-year period. I, was, I came into the agency shortly after the animal rule was implemented back in 2002 um, in between my two tours at the agency. I think we're doing a much better job at leaning in with respect to trying to bring some of these technologies forward, trying to look at ways that we can lean forward and develop the animal models that are going to form the basis of some of these product approvals, trying to put out perspective guidance and talk to manufacturers and provide more regulatory clarity. Uh, I think there are still challenges around the incentives in this market, uh, frankly. I think the having been on the other side of this in the private sector, um, the, the prospect of being able to commercialize something just for stockpiling purposes sometimes isn't enough of an incentive um, to offset the enormous uh, capital costs of some of these endeavors. And I think we're also looking at, you know, we focused on some of the um, immediate danger, some of the pathogens we, we knew, uh, and we've, we're developing countermeasures for them. I think we're looking at a future where it's going to be much easier to bioengineer some of these things in ways that we um, can't fully anticipate and create very new risks. Senator Murray. Well, thank you very much to all of you. In the wake of her, uh, Hurricane Irma, 
as hospitals were evacuating, the top priority was protecting vulnerable populations, including people and individuals with disabilities and children and pregnant women. In every public health emergency, we've got to pay unique attention to people with functional needs that put them particularly at risk. And that is true for preparedness planning and for emergency response, including, for example, making sure that there's adequate, um, emerg um, adequate medical countermeasure development and dosing guidance for children and pregnant women. PAPA actually acknowledges that there must be specific attention paid to at-risk individuals, and we want to build on that last reauthorization because I think we can do better. So I want to ask each of you to briefly describe your agency's efforts to meet the needs of all people, and what more can we do to ensure that when it comes to public health preparedness, we are prepared for everyone? And Dr. Red, let me just start with you, and if we could just go down the panel. Thank, thank you for that question. Um, let me just highlight a couple of things that we're doing at CDC. First of all, our um, guidance through the public health emergency preparedness program requires that states have a plan for uh, persons with um, functional needs. So that is part of the planning process. Uh, we also work closely with the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, depending on what the emergency is, but work with them to make sure that those, um, that those needs are being covered. I'd also say in the stockpile that we've made progress in uh, procuring products that are needed to treat children. Um, for example, uh, there are 100,000 treatment courses of oseltamivir in suspension form that are intended or targeted for children. What can we do better? Um, I think there's, there's always more work to do. I think that um, we need to make sure that these plans are exercised and that we've actually covered all the basis and that they're not just written on paper, but that we, we actually are able to, uh, to execute the plans that we've made. Okay, Dr. Gottlieb. I would just highlight that um, Papa gave us a new authority to put forward to your point. Uh, treatment guidelines that can help guide the application of some of these therapeutics, particularly with respect to um, uh, pediatric dosing, uh, which we've used. Uh, we've approved 12 drugs under the animal rule. Seven have been approved with pediatric dosing requirements. I think this is something that we can continue to do better. Um, I think one of the ways that we're going to do that is to have better, um, better development of animal models that um, have better natural histories associated with the, the pathogens in those animal models that allow us to predict what the therapeutic impact is going to be on a pediatric population. And so this is some basic research that we need to do to develop those models that are going to allow us to then extrapolate uh, into a pediatric population and other populations for that matter, other vulnerable populations to your point, allow us to have dosing uh, guidelines for those populations. Is there anything we can do within PAPA to help improve that? Um, I, I think to, to, to Senator Burr's point as well, I think this, this is a scientific basis, still needs further development. Um, Papa gave the agency resources and we've developed some um, discrete expertise in this area as a result of the legislation. I think that's a place we can continue to make more investment. Okay, Dr. Keller. Thank you, ma'am, for the question. I'd just like to highlight during the hurricanes, we actually did uh, some very specific things around uh, people with functional disabilities. I don't know if uh, any of the members have heard of Empower, but it's a program that allows us to basically identify in the CMS database for Medicare people who are uh, dependent on durable medical equipment. So based on requests from states, we can provide actually very uh, specific information where these people live with by zip code and by address. Uh, in cases of Burma, Florida was able to do a reverse 911 call uh, to those people at risk well before any evacuation orders were put out to the general public to advise them that, uh, uh, that they should uh, consider leaving before uh, things got worse. Uh, in the cases of uh, Maria, we actually used that data to identify on the islands of uh, St. Thomas, St. Croix, uh, people who are uh, dialysis dependent. And after the storm uh, passed, uh, we were able to basically uh, link up with the urban search and rescue teams and actually recover uh, dialysis-dependent uh, people and basically evacuate them to safety. Uh, so there, there is that part of it. One of the limitations currently is is that's only for Medicare data. The state Medicaid data is is limited. We we can do that if we have access to that and provide the same information. So that's one area that we could probably benefit from working with you all to see how we can have the states work collaboratively to use that information prospectively. 
Um, to add to the points that were made by the other gentlemen, uh, clearly our BARDA has uh, looked at uh, specific products for pediatric patients as well as, uh, uh, as people with immunocompromise, and there are products that are in the stockpile today uh, that are to benefit both of those populations. One of the areas, and I highlighted it in my testimony, is on the national disaster health care system. One of the specific areas we'd like to do is take the, the uh, learning or lessons learned from Ebola, where we created a uh, national uh, uh, excellence uh, center of excellence at Nebraska University for Infectious Disease and replicate that for other very important uh, trauma-related or disaster-related areas like pediatrics. Uh, we think that that would be a way where not only can you create the necessarily, uh, if you will, uh, critical mass of expertise, but also teach uh, through telemedicine and through teleconsultations to provide support during disasters. And the last area I'd like to do, and a shout out to our VA colleagues, is the VA was a very significant uh, contributor to our response to Harvey. Uh, HHS responded and, and took care of 36,000 patients. VA provided care to 21,000 patients. Many of those were VA beneficiaries, but some of those were, many of those were families of VA beneficiaries, and a, a larger number was actually uh, the general public. And so the VA has unique uh, capabilities as it relates to uh, uh, geriatric populations, and that's one area that we can probably uh, benefit from in terms of utilizing some of their expertise. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Cadillac, Dr. Gottlieb, let's talk about the flu. Um, this is the 100th anniversary of the 1980 influenza pandemic that killed an estimated 50 million people worldwide, 600,000 in the United States. According to the Center for Disease Control, year in and year out, between 12,000 and 56,000 Americans die as a result of seasonal flu. Uh, we heard last week in our opioids hearing that, that opioids kills more Americans than car accidents, and those statistics that I just read would suggest that in a severe year, so could the flu. Dr. Collins, the head of the National Institutes of Health, has made the prediction before our committees that if we keep up our investments in biomedical research, which Senator Blunt, Senator Murray, the rest of us have been doing pretty well the last three years, that we may have a universal flu vaccine as well as a vaccine for Zika within the next decade. And Dr. Fauci at NIH has said that the most effective method for protecting Americans against another pandemic influenza is to encourage and invest in the development and stockpiling of, of influenza vaccines that will broadly protect against the virus. Well, in Tennessee right now, the hospitals are filling up with people with the flu. So Dr. Cadillac and Dr. Gottlieb, if researchers at NIH or any sort of partner with them discover a platform technology that could speed the development of a universal flu vaccine, what would BARDA do to support the advanced research and development of that technology. And Dr. Gottlieb, what is the FDA ready to do to encourage the use of that technology for new and innovative vaccines? And I have three minutes. <laughs> Chairman, um, I'll be very brief then in the sense that BART has an integrated portfolio with NIAD. So once uh, a product gets through phase 2A clinical uh, trials, they would be transitioned over to BARDA that would take the advanced development through to fruition um, so that part of it is done, uh, and they have the capacity to basically identify manufacturers who could produce that either in eggs or tissue cell, cell culture or emerging technologies. Dr. Gartley? Yeah, I'll just quickly add, we, we already have in, in, in development um, vaccines that might be universal flu vaccines that, that presumably elicit a T-cell response uh, and, and could, uh, could achieve what you're outlining. You know, we, we, we continue to provide advice to um, clinical developers and manufacturers on the proper pathway for looking at trying to bring those new technologies through. I would point to one place where the legislative suite that we've adopted to try to um, address some of these biological threats has been helpful is in the development of manufacturing capacity that could greatly aid in, in the scale up of these, these new vaccines, particularly cell-based manufacturing, which we've made a lot of investments in, as you know, um, that could provide the proper platform for uh, the development of these vaccines. Dr. Gottlieb, this is 
a related matter. We're all concerned about Puerto Rico and the impact of the hurricane there. I think you told me at one point that maybe one third of the economy of Puerto Rico has to do with medical technology. Is that, is that right? That's Something? about right. It's about 30 percent. And many of those facilities, as you described, were destroyed. Are, are they rebuilding in Puerto Rico or are they rebuilding other places or do, do you know yet? Because that could have a major effect on Puerto Rico's future. Right. And, and, and you know, we're obviously very concerned about the situation in Puerto Rico for a host of reasons, not least of which is that Puerto Rican economy is very dependent upon that uh, skilled manufacturing base. Um, I'm happy to tell you that all of the facilities that we were concerned about that produced products that we were worried could go into shortage of the facilities continue to remain offline and now back on the grid. Oh. So the facilities themselves actually didn't sustain a lot of damage. It was the power grid and the infrastructure in between the facilities to try to move move equipment in and off the island that sustained a lot of the damage. The facilities are actually were fairly hardened. But they're all, the ones we were worried about are back on the grid. There are still some facilities that aren't on the grid, but they, they have such redundant um, electric um, generation capacity that we don't really have concerns about the product supply coming out of those facilities. So the situation now looks a lot better than it did four months ago. Mr. Chairman, I think my time's about up, and I'll give the rest of it back. Senator Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I wanted to start with the, uh, <clears throat> to start with the um, reference that I made earlier to the train derailment in Philadelphia as an example of uh, good preparation. <clears throat> Part of that has its origin in the fact that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that um, it happened in an urban area where you have uh, <coughs> not just the resources, but you have um, hospitals and, and uh, a healthcare infrastructure which is close by way of distance as well as by way of coordination. I represent a state that has 48 rural counties out of a total of 67 counties, so we have a lot of small towns and rural areas where you don't have the institutional capacity necessarily um, and in the event of a, a, um, an emergency you c that could be exacerbated by distance and other, um, other challenges. So when you have this type of gap or potential gap um, w where some communities may be particularly vulnerable, I'd start with Dr. Cadillac and then go to Dr. Red. Um, in terms of the hospital preparedness program, so-called HPP, as well as PHEP, how do those um, programs attempt to close the gap in uh, preparedness among states and regions? Well, thank you, sir, for the question. I think the point is, is that the way we're structuring them right now, we're trying to actually build health care, promote health care coalitions, which are collections of hospitals as well as other entities like emergency medical services. So you can build a regional, and that's why we'd like to expand that effort to basically do it so not only would it cover specific regions within the state, but statewide and across states, so that you could develop a much stronger backbone, if you will, to do this. Um, I think the idea of basically building out the National Academy of Study of Sciences basically had a study on trauma systems, which is worthy of reviewing because it, it highlights the important role that has a foundational capability for the country, not only for day-to-day -day routine activities, but for these extraordinary events, train derailments that happen not only in Pennsylvania, but in the state of Washington, uh, as, as an example, uh, become a central piece of that. Uh, my interest in this is seeing how we can leverage all those pieces together with some of the federal assets the VA identified. Madigan Army Medical Center was a critical first responder in the train derailment in Washington State. And so the thing is, how do we basically build, forge a public-private partnership for those purposes that can basically strengthen it? So not only do you have the transport mechanisms with emergency medical services, but also telemedicine, teleconsultation that would be available from the specialty services, these level one trauma service hospitals or level one expert hospitals like Nebraska to basically deal with a range of topical areas. Dr. Before moving to Dr. Red, I just want to in inject a, another question. <clears throat> um, this is an authorizing committee and a reauthorization process, but I want to specifically ask, in light of the question I posed, are there additional authorities you need or additional dollars? Um, sir, I would suggest both. We have a $3.3 trillion health care system for which right now we invest $250, approximately $250 million uh, annually for preparedness and resilience. Um, 
I think it just highlights the fact that it's kind of a drop in the bucket. Um, I don't think it's necessarily the role of the federal government to pay for the whole bill, but certainly we need to look at a variety of incentives, whether that's through CMS reimbursements, whether that's uh, through insurance programs, tax benefits, that would incentivize hospitals to do it. Our conversations with uh, some of the outside partners, we held a uh, kind of a listening session with 35 stakeholders last week, including hospital associations, is that they're all willing, and we have hospitals volunteering to help. Mm. I think they're just looking for means to do this in a way that is mutually beneficial. Thanks, Dr. Dr. Red. I only left you 45 seconds. Oh, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, we actually met with um, s selected state health officials last spring to ask this exact question that you asked. Are there things that we should be doing differently to support rural health departments? And the conclusion was, um, it was a little bit surprising to me that the capabilities that are needed for rural districts and urban are largely the same. Um, detection capability, communications, um, incident command, or the, the structure to run responses. But there are additional, um, as, as you mentioned, there are additional uh, sort of layers of, uh, of challenge with transport, access to medical care. Um, I think that this is an issue a little bit beyond uh, emergency response, and I think the idea of telemedicine as a tool is, is a great idea, but it's essentially a question of how do we make sure that those communities have access to medical care um, it, during and uh, not during emergencies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Senator Burton. Thank you for your work on pandemics and on BARDA for a long period of time. It's very valuable. The committee's worked on a long time. I appreciate uh, Chairman Alexander and, and uh, Senator Murray and the work that they've done. And thank Dr. Cadillac for calling out the VA. You know, as chairman of the Veterans Committee in the Senate, I've learned a lot of things about our delivery system and capabilities in terms of VA health care, which is the second largest employer in the United States government. A lot of people don't realize that, but that's how big and pervasive VA is, and they, they provide significant health care to seniors by virtue of the, their delivery system. So your call out for them and what they did in Houston, Houston is appreciated. Also, I'd say that most of the research dollars that are invested by the United States government in, in control groups are through the VA because you have a control group of patients where you can do a good research sample. And, and our veterans and our Veterans Administration provides a great service in terms of that. Which brings me to, to Admiral Redd. Is the VA a part of, you, you have your emergency preparedness grants that you give to the local governments. And when we had the incident we had happen in Hawaii last week where we had a false alarm on a missile attack, which was rather unsettling to the people of Hawaii, and quite frankly, it was unsettling to me. That's, that's an emergency grant challenge you want to make sure you don't ever have with a pandemic where you get the wrong information going out from a designated agency at the wrong time. Do we concentrate a lot, a lot on that to protect ourselves from bad information getting out? on pandemics or on diseases? I, th I think that really um, gets to one of the core uh, requirements that we have, which is to be sure that the information that we're providing is as valid as it can be. And if we're not certain, but we believe people need to know, we make sure that those uh, caveats are, uh, are expressed. Um, really gets to the, some of the basic principles of risk communication to tell people what we know, what we don't know, and what we're doing to, uh, to find out those things that we don't know. Dr. Godley, I appreciate your mention of, re of priority review vouchers. Uh, Senator Casey and I worked on PRRVs uh, for rare diseases that affect children and successfully passed legislation. And I think the first drug's been approved now on that PRV that was issued by the department. And we appreciate that. And your use of that to expand the use of PRVs to encourage the development of drugs that either are, are very costly to develop or hard to develop is very important. How do you, how do you intend to use that to expand the development in terms of new pharmaceuticals? Well, as you know, the, the, the PRV program provides um, an additional incentive for manufacturers to try to develop uh, products for these purposes. And so I think it's one of the tools that Congress contemplated to try to address some of the challenges that we've already talked about that I mentioned, which is that, that sometimes this isn't 
um, a typical market where you have the usual um, market-based incentives to try to try to make the capital investments to develop these products. Um, you know, there's there's work going on to look at what impact the PRVs have had. Um, we've we've implemented the program. We've seen sponsors come forward and be awarded these PRVs and sell them in the secondary market um, um, as a way to try to recoup some of the cost of the investment. On that uh, same subject, I've done a lot of work on a disease called Batten's, which is an incurable disease of young people. I had a personal situation that got piked my interest in my district and when I was in the House, and I've remained interested in that. It's a very difficult disease for which there is no cure, but with the gene therapy development and the delivery system of pharmaceuticals to specific parts of the body and the brain in particular, there is hope and promise for that. Do you... Do you issue guidance letters to research hospitals or research facilities to give them guidance on how they can test or develop to work on a breakthrough drug for a disease like Batten's? Uh, Senator, I think one of the the areas of um, the most promise right now that we're looking at when we look across our portfolio is what's going on in our Center for Biologics with respect to cell-based therapies and gene-based therapies, where we have the ability to cure inherited disorders, um, devastating inherited disorders that weren't treatable um, just a short time ago. We're going to be putting out um, this starting probably this spring, maybe a little earlier, um, a suite of product-specific guidances on how sponsors can address um, certain disorders with the gene therapy to try to provide as much regulatory clarity as possible. We're going to look at some of the more common disorders first, but we're going to try to work through some of these more, some of these rarer diseases to make sure that product developers have a lot of clarity around what the pathway forward would be. I commend you on the leadership. You've shown that effort already and plan to support you in any way we can to help you do that in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for testifying. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Senator Burr and uh, Chair Alexander and uh, Senator Murray. I'm so pleased to be able to serve on this committee. Thank you very much. I'd like to come back to something that uh, Senator Murray and I think several others have talked about, which is the importance of connection to local, connection and support to local um, public health um, uh, organizations. You know, in the past year um, in Minnesota, we have dealt with three infectious disease outbreaks, um, measles, uh, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and also syphilis and all of these outbreaks have required a really immediate response as well as a sustained response as we've gone forward and Minnesota has traditionally as I'm sure you know um, invested heavily in emergency preparedness and um, dealing with infectious diseases probably because of our history in agriculture uh, more than anything. Um, but in these particular situations, the financial resources that we had were not enough, and so we turned to um, the CDC for um, support, and of course, no fault of yours, that we didn't, there were no resources there. So what we did is we moved forward with the state legislature to pass um, an emergency public health response account so that we can respond quickly because speed is of the essence when you're dealing with these kinds of outbreaks. So my, my question is... Um, uh, my question is, in what ways do you think that a, um, an emergency response fund would strengthen our federal and state um, efforts during an outbreak or after a disaster? And um, uh, maybe if you could just talk a little bit about that, that'd be helpful. I think, thank you very much. I, th I think that uh, resources are critical in responding to an emergency. Um, we uh, had... Um, lengthy delays both in the Ebola response and in the Zika response uh, before funding became available and I think that the, that hindered um, that hindered what we were able to accomplish. There's been um, discussion uh, both in Congress and in the administration about how to do that and I think that, that those discussions will continue but I think something along those lines would be quite helpful. Let me mention one thing that we've done um, specifically uh, once funds are available to make sure that they're used more quickly. We um, uh, had a, um, a notice of funding opportunity that we opened to our um, grantees through the Public Health Emergency Preparedness Program, allowed them to apply for funds. There were no funds in this award, but we have a, uh, an, auth an approved but unfunded uh, grant mechanism so that we don't get delayed at the federal level uh, once funding is, is appropriated. Okay. Thank you. Senator Dr. Smith, Kendler. if I could just add, uh, there exists already uh, in authorizing language uh, for a fund for HHS uh, has $57,000 in it. Um, obviously, it's not an authorization problem. Uh, 
But I just want to highlight the fact that, yes, there is a fund that's needed. It should be a fund that necessarily is managed by the Secretary, that based on a public health emergency, uh, there can be, um, if you will, uh, distribution of funds from that, uh, from that resource, and that it can be used across HHS or to fund states and locals in a way that would be uh, rapid. Uh, I, obviously, there's going to be a need for, um, it would be kind of like the equivalent, the medical equivalent of the disaster relief fund, I think. Uh, but I think there would be obviously a requirement to notify Congress in those uh, situations uh, and basis of reporting back on uh, some occasions to make sure the funds are being spent uh, appropriately. Absolutely. So that would be my... Right. Thank you. So you're add. essentially, we need to make sure we have good accountability that the funds right. are being spent the way they're supposed to be yes, spent, which I would completely agree with. And I realize that this is an authorizing question and not an appropriating discussion here, but would, Dr. Kladdick, would you, if such a fund were to be made available, what would you advise um, in terms of the level of funding that would be necessary to uh, have this actually be workable? Well, ma'am, I... I, I I would have to get it back to you in a firm number, but I think what you probably looked at is what happened with Ebola or the original pan, uh, pandemic influenza appropriations, which are on the order of 2.5 to 3.5 billion dollars. And again, what you need to hedge is the, the opportunity for Congress to weigh in fully, and, and again, on the basis of time. So. Um, obviously, there are a lot of factors to be considered in there, but there's a rich historical record that could probably draw drawn upon to identify appropriate level that would get us through the, the initial crisis to the point where Congress can, you know, basically perform its fiduciary responsibilities. Great. Thank you very much. Um Senator Burr, I was um, struck by what you said about how we need to stick to our knitting on this committee and not um, expand too much, and also how important it is to, um, to think about the processes that we have in place um, with this um, authorized legislation to make sure that it works well. And so I appreciate your comments. I think it gives us some good food for thought as we consider how we can respond as quickly as possible when there's an emergency. Thank we, you. We again welcome you to the committee. Senator Young. Well, thank you, Chairman. Uh, the World Organization for Animal Health estimates that uh, roughly 60% of known human diseases are transmitted from animals to people. They're of so-called zoonotic origin. Every year, an average of five human diseases appear, such as Ebola, HIV, and new strains of influenza, three of which are, are zoonotic. In my home state of Indiana, in, uh, we suffered considerable losses in the widespread bird flu outbreak, mm -hmm. uh, one that led to the de destruction of 400,000 turkeys. And this followed 2015 in the outbreak that led to the loss of 48 million uh, pol poultry. So, uh, Dr. Cadillac, what are we doing now to prevent uh, the, the spread and, uh, and, and transmission of diseases from animals uh, to human beings? Well, sir, I... I I have to say that, quite frankly, we need to do more. The One Health concept, which you're outlining, is an important one. Uh, influenza is not the only disease that's a zoonotic importance that's pandemic potential. There are SARS and MERS are examples of others. Uh, but I think I need to really defer to, to Admiral Red to talk about the role of CDC here and their role of surveillance, because, quite frankly, they are on the cutting edge to ensure you can recognize those events rapidly as they had Thank in you. Iowa, Admiral. I think. Th thank you, Dr. Cadillac and uh, Senator Young. Uh, we are working very closely with USDA uh, on this issue, and particularly on influenza. Uh, we were really uh, joined at the hip in the response to these, uh, this importation of, uh, of, of these uh, influenza, avian influenza viruses. Uh, our role was to make sure that we understood the biology and that if any human infections occurred, that those were rapidly detected and treated and, and to protect workers in the process of, uh, of the culling that was going on. You no doubt do the best you can with the resources and authorities you have. Uh, number one, how are we doing with respect to tracking and then responding to uh, these, these situations and preparing for the next one? And then secondarily, speak to any additional authorities or resources you might need to optimize your efforts. Uh, um, 
I think that we're, um, given the, the strategy that we have, which is a reactive one, uh, I think we're doing well at detecting and uh, containing uh, importations. I think that the- That, that predicate caught my attention. Yes. Given, given that our strategy is a reactive one. Right, right. And I think that the ability of, of inf uh, to prevent the importation of influenza viruses that can be transmi transmitted by migratory waterfowl, for example, yes, it's very challenging. And I think, I think there's a lot being done on the animal health side. I think that it is a challenge. And the, the basic strategy is identify and limit to the extent possible to, to, uh, to one flock or as small, a, a small an area as possible. And through that process to prevent human infection, should the virus have the capability to be transmitted or to be, uh, to be infectious to humans. I, if I may, just for 15 seconds, I would also um, talk about the importance of thinking about animal drugs in, in this uh, in our approach, and CURES, as you know, extended the EOA authority to animal drugs. Um, we might also contemplate trying to think about how we create incentives for the development of animal drugs targeted to some of these threats, including maybe a breakthrough therapy designation for animal drugs or other kinds of creative policy approaches uh, to make sure that that's part of our approach as well. Well, thank you. I, I look forward to working with each of you. I'll, I'll probably have some follow-up questions I'll submit in writing, and, and uh, uh, hopefully we can improve our, our current systems uh, for dealing with these matters. Um, Dr. Gottlieb, you just admit, again, once again mentioned incentives uh, in, in the animal context, but I'd like to pivot to our antibacterial uh, resistance threats. Every year, at least 2 million people in the U.S. acquire serious bacterial infections that are resistant to one or more type of antibacterial drugs. However, as I understand it, there are very few companies that are developing new antibiotics, and those focused on the most serious bacterial threats is even fewer. Is additional action needed to immediately incentivize the development of drugs to combat this growing global problem? And uh, if so, what might uh, in new incentives look like? Uh, and, and what, what might we do uh, as members of Congress to provide those incentives? Senator, thank you for the question. As you know, Cures created a number of new um, vehicles and, and some incentives for development in this space. We, we, we're encouraged by the early interest we're seeing in those, in those pathways, things like L, the LPAD pathway, um, and I think we're going to have more information soon on how well they're working. I mean, we can always contemplate additional policy steps, and I'd be happy to talk to your office and work with you on that. Um, I think that this is an area to your point that we need to think about what more we can be doing. But uh, Congress has done some, taken some steps recently um, that we're very encouraged by. We are seeing a lot of good early interest in them. Thank you. Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the witnesses. I have great confidence in this committee's ability to work on this uh, POP reauthorization in a bipartisan way. And I have two observations and a concern. So an observation is this, and some of you have alluded to it, and Senator Isaacson's questions alluded to it. One of the tasks of emergency preparedness is to prepare for attack, and you've talked about chemical, biological, Senator Isaacson talked about the incident in Hawaii this weekend. Um, I just want to say, kind of for the record and for the public, the prospect of, of nuclear war is being discussed with a lot of frequency in this building uh, to a degree that I haven't seen in the time I've been in the Senate. We've had, I'm on the Armed Services and Foreign Relations Committees, we've had a, a series of hearings even open where there has been discussion about the prospect of land war on the Korean Peninsula. We had an Armed Services hearing recently where a witness volunteered in public, and it was sort of a non sequitur why, why we bring it up, as a member of the administration, about what the likely cost of reconstructing Kansas City would be after a nuclear attack. Um, and I noticed an article in the New York Times a few days ago, the CDC wants to get people prepared for nuclear war. It was supposed, supposed to happen yesterday. On January 16, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention will present a workshop titled Public Health Response to a Nuclear Detonation for doctors, government officials, emergency responders, and others whom, if they survived, would be responsible for overseeing the emergency response to a nuclear attack. Quote, while nuclear detonation is unlikely, the CDA stated on its website, it would have devastating results and there would be limited time to take critical protection steps despite the fear surrounding such an event, planning and preparation can lessen 
deaths and illness, quote, join us for this session of Grand Rounds to learn what public health programs have done on a federal, state, and local level to prepare for nuclear detonation. Learn how planning and preparation efforts for nuclear detonation are similar and different from other emergency response planning efforts. That's off the CDC website, and the article goes on to say the agenda for the day includes, quote, preparing for the unthinkable, quote, roadmap to radiation preparedness, and, quote, using data and decision aids to drive response efforts. I understand the CDC uh, rescheduled that, canceled it from yesterday, and had a, a roundtable on flu instead. But this sort of, you know, realistic discussion about these prospects, and then add to it the Dr. Strange love like incident over the weekend where a state sent out a mass email telling people there was a ballistic missile incoming to Hawaii, which occasioned 38 minutes of panic. And then on Tuesday, the Japanese state broadcaster, NHK, put out a warning that North Korea had fired a nuclear missile and urged Japanese citizens to take cover. That was retracted within a very few minutes. There is a lot of discussion, some very intentional and some frightened, about the prospect of nuclear war that's happening. And this is in the province of your agencies. And I just sort of want to put that on the record, uh, that, that that is sort of a normal area for discussion these days, I find incredibly frightening. And the normality of it, I find incredibly frightening. Second observation I want to make is this. This is a discussion about national security. We're involved in a budget debate right now. Right now, spending bill ends January 19th. And one of the points of argument is whether we might fund defense accounts over the budget caps and not non-defense accounts. You are about national security, you are about national defense, and all of your agencies are funded through the non-defense accounts of the federal budget. And so any suggestion that we would increase defense budgeting but hold the line and put non-defense agencies subject to their caps would not really fund the national security priorities that you're here about. And that's something we've got to grapple with. Here's my question. I'm very worried about this Hawaii incident. Uh, because in a time of heightened tension, we know from history that wars often start accidentally. There's a miscommunication and a misunderstanding. There's an overreaction. That's how World War I started. That's how most wars start. I know there's going to be a hearing later in the week, I think, on the House Armed Services Committee about this. I'm sure there, there is an investigation at the state level. But part of the responsibility, and Dr. Cadillac, I guess this is mostly directed to, to you, Part of the responsibility in the emergency preparedness and response side is accurate communication. And as a former mayor and governor, that it depends heavily upon communication between federal, state, and local officials. So as you approach this thought, thinking about reauthorization in this climate where things can sometimes be pretty tense, how do you look at that state, local, federal coordination effort, especially as it uh, especially as it deals with communication of accurate information and, and knocking down inaccurate information as quickly as you can. Well, sir, one seriously, uh, we take it very seriously, number one. Number two is uh, the experience we had with hurricanes, particularly Hurricane Maria, I think, highlighted some of the challenges. In my testimony, I, I identified some of the in incident command issues that we have to address, which really is not only information out, but information in. I think the issues that we, we need to work with, not only with our CDC brethren, but with state and local authorities, as well with FEMA. Met with them just as of yesterday, talking about how do we uh, integrate our efforts closer so that we have better information exchange on these kinds of issues, whether they're hurricanes, pandemics, or whatever, uh, is one that, quite frankly, you need to kind of think through, learn through, not only experience as we did with the hurricanes, but exercises as we did. So just to highlight one thing, uh, since I've kind of been around the block on these set of issues, going back to 2000, it's been a routine practice in the U.S. government, the federal government at least, to, to exercise the idea of a nuclear detonation. Most, most concerning then was terrorism as a matter of an improvised nuclear device. So it's not necessarily new. Uh, the, obviously, the context is different. Uh, but I think the point here, though, to your issue is it does require a closer lash up with our federal partners on these issues to make sure that we have good cross-lateral horizontal flow of information, as well as with our state and local folks. And so we're investigating with FEMA, just as another example, how we can basically work together, embed both our health and disaster people in state and local state EOCs to, again, work more seamlessly uh, with our state uh, colleagues. So we're looking at all kinds of options right now to that effect. 
I appreciate it, Mr. Chair. Thank you for letting me go over. I hope you'll follow the investigation of the Hawaii incident for your own purposes, because for purposes of having good information and that coordination, I suspect there will be some lessons that will come out of that that would be relevant to other circumstances as well. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Cain. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to applaud you for your leadership in this area. More than a decade ago, we established a port security program that led to radiation portal monitors being installed at our major ports so that they could screen incoming and outgoing cargo, trucks, and individuals for radiological materials. And I contrast that port security effort with what I perceive to be a real vulnerability in our ability to detect and effectively and quickly respond to an attack using biological or chemical agents. So Dr. Cadlick and Dr. Red, I'd like you both to address the level of preparedness that we have to respond and detect, first of all, to detect a biological or chemical attack and to respond to it. I would like specifically to know whether cities have used some of the federal funds that Doc, that the Admiral referred to, uh, to install sensors that would be able to detect uh, these agents. And I'd also like you both to comment on the preparedness of our hospitals to cope with the victims of a biological or chemical attack. I remember being in Israel many years ago and being so impressed with their preparation and their ability to convert their hospitals to respond to that kind of attack. Dr. Cadlick, why don't we start with you and then Admiral. Thank you, Senator Collins. Um, I think one of the issues, and again, um, I have some insights on this historically, but currently the BioWatch program run by the Department of Homeland Security provides area protection for cities. So. Uh, I think there's a real uh, desire, and I've met with the new WMD, um, I don't know, directorate, uh, assistant secretary over DHS, about improvements we can make to our chemical and biological uh, attack kind of detection. Uh, quite frankly, our uh, capabilities are fairly still limited and primitive, quite frankly. Um, and I think there's a dis dis sincere desire on the part of DHS and HHS between ourselves to basically do improvements to do that. To your second issue, how well prepared we are, uh, certainly we have a strategic national stockpile that can address many but not all of these threat agents. Uh, so there's work to do there in terms of some of the development and procurement we need to do on those issues. But one of the critical areas that collectively CDC and our office are considering is really on the last mile of distribution. Uh, as mentioned by Senator Murray, we can move strategic national stockpile resources uh, anywhere in the country within 12 hours. The question is, is from that point forward, getting it into the hands and into the mouths of every American person who's at risk is, is a significant challenge that I think collectively we need to work on. But now I'll defer to Senator, uh, pardon me, Admiral Red for his comments. Um, thank you. I think this is a really important question. If we are um, attacked in this way, the effectiveness of our response will depend on the speed and the scale with which we respond. Um, I think that the, uh, the way that a biological attack would manifest itself uh, would probably be different than a chemical attack. A chemical attack would primarily require a local, a near instantaneous local response. Um, the the uh, CDC Strategic National Stockpile has deployed um, antidotes for nerve agents um, over a thousand different locations have pallets of these antidotes that are available to supplement the treatment that would be available uh, immediately. We also have a very um, getting ever better capability to, de to determine exactly which toxin has been, has been used. So there's a laboratory element that CDC is also responsible for. Um, on the biological side, 
Um, we've made great strides with the laboratory response network. Uh, every state has at least one laboratory that's able to use um, advanced techniques to diagnose these infections. There are a total of 150 laboratories around the world, including laboratories that can test food, can test water, uh, environmental samples, uh, samples from animals. Um, sort of looking to the future, um, the technology of whole genome sequencing is something that we need to continue to push out that would allow uh, very rapid and um, we talk about faster and more accurate. This is actually more information than we can get from current technologies. Things like um, uh, resistance to antibiotics or relationships of certain organisms to other, uh, you know, where did it come from kinds of questions. Thank you. Ma'am, can I just add one thing and yes. your question about how our hospitals would do? Yes. I think it was noted by the chairman that even a bad flu season as the current one we have is overwhelming our hospital exactly. systems. Exactly. That's one reason that I asked the question. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Collins. Uh, Senator Jones, welcome. We're glad to have you a part of this committee. I acknowledged your new membership a little earlier, but we're glad to have you here. This is a committee that has many different points of view, but works well together. So we, this is another subject that 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 uh, that we we intend to have some bipartisan success on. Senator Warren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we're here today to talk about PAPA, the framework for our response to all sorts of emergencies: natural disasters, accidents with hazardous materials, terrorist attacks, pandemics, you name it. So I returned just a few days ago from a trip to Puerto Rico, and I know some of my colleagues have also uh, uh, been to Puerto Rico recently. And during my trip, it was clear that nearly four months after the storm, the crisis in Puerto Rico is a daily reality for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. So Dr. Cadlick, you're the top official in charge of preparedness and response at HHS. What is the biggest thing you've learned from the situation in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands about how we need to strengthen our preparedness and response capabilities? Well, thank you, ma'am. I, I think there are a couple of levels to go here. Uh, one is improving the resilience of our innate hospital health care structure. Uh, that was one area. The other thing is, is really the resilience of our public health system, which is a separate piece but related uh, piece. Uh, in Puerto Rico in particular, they were uh, in initial stages after that terrible devastation that literally devastated the whole island and every life was touched. Uh, it was very difficult for the, for the local public health and medical infrastructure to stay. There are some incredible heroic stories of doctors, nurses, uh, laboratorians who basically responded, public health officials who, who left their families, left their houses in disarray, and basically went to respond to help their neighbors and their communities. Um, but I think that's one piece of this that needs to be addressed, what happens before the storm. The second piece is how quickly can we move in. We had uh, deployed uh, teams to Puerto Rico, advanced of both Irma and Maria, to be available once the storm passed, both storms passed, to basically respond quickly. Uh, but even so, with the level of devastation, that was a huge piece of it. And a huge piece of it was the lingering devastation, not only the loss of communications and electricity, uh, but also the damage to the ports and the airfields that limited some of the movement. So I think one of the lessons learned was you want to go in uh, aggressively before the storm if you can, and we literally put people's lives at risk from our response teams, including people from Massachusetts, Massachusetts One, that responded to all yes. three storms. Uh, they're, they're great people and, uh, again, representative of your constituents from other states around the country that responded. Uh, but also there's a piece of this that we have to somewhat remove some of the dependencies in the responses, um, seeing how we can move quicker and faster if that's possible. A lot of it was dependent on being able to transport through air or barge. Again, responding to an island is a tough one. So, so I, I appreciate this, and I'm glad we're trying to think about what we need to do and what we need to do better, and to acknowledge heroic efforts, but we need a better structure here. But to apply these lessons, we also need good data. You know, we need to know not just what we got right or what we got wrong, but when we got it right, when we got it wrong. 
by how much and what kind of difference it would make on the ground. One of the things that struck me during my trip last week was how sketchy the data are. So, for example, I met with the federal and Puerto Rican officials at FEMA's field office, and they said no more issues with potable water. Uh, no waterborne diseases, all the water is drinkable. And I asked this specifically, you turn on the taps, you hold a glass under it, the water will be drinkable, is drinkable, everywhere on the island. Sounds great. Not so much, though. Um, I met with the Massachusetts State Police volunteers who told me they'd observed raw sewage uh, in the water uh, at the public health center that I visited in Louisa. They said they still don't have potable water, no drinkable water for their patients. And they said they serve 100,000 people and that none of them have drinkable water. We heard the same kind of contradictions when it came to statements about how many people lacked power. Uh, so, Dr. Cadlick, I, I get that public health emergencies are really challenging circumstances, and it's hard to get good data. But how do HHS and other agencies collect data in a way that is reliable so that you can deploy your resources effectively, hold yourselves accountable to get the job done that needs to be done? Well, ma'am, we learned a lot from the experience in Puerto Rico and trying to rectify that. Um, because of the loss of communication, cell towers and the like, the ability to get information either from local authorities or local hospitals or clinics was pra practically nil. We literally went to the point uh, at one time to basically use runners from the National Guard who would have satellite phones to, to, to basically go to hospitals and clinics and report information out. Uh, but that's a major consideration and, and lesson that we're still learning that we have to address because it's a major shortfall. Because uh, if you were to add, again, a terrible event like this, a terrible earthquake or a nuclear or radiological event, uh, you could imagine that the, the circumstances would even be more challenging. But that's an area of great intense concern, quite frankly, and work that we have to do. Well, I'm, I'm very concerned about this, and I don't have time. I'm out of time now, so I can't ask Rear Admiral Redd and Dr. Gottlieb about their work in Puerto Rico. But Senator Cassidy and I sent a letter to Chairman Alexander signed by seven other members of this committee asking for a hearing on the recovery efforts in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and I hope we'll be able to hold that hearing. You know, Puerto Rico might not be in the front pages anymore, but it is a humanitarian crisis, and we have a moral and a constitutional responsibility to exercise oversight responsibilities here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Warren. Senator Cassidy. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cadillac, I'm going to put you on the payroll, man. Uh, earlier, you were responding to Senator Smith regarding a possible bill. We have that bill. Uh, Public Health Emergency Fund actually stimulated by conversations with Dr. Frieden, and he said that in the Ebola crisis, there was 10 different authorizations that had to be signed off on before he could get somebody to travel emergently to Africa kind of crazy. Uh, and I kept on contrasting the authorization process we were going through, which was cumbersome and slow, with that before and after Katrina. Before Katrina, FEMA had to come to get the initial dollars. Uh, after Katrina, Congress recognized that's not the best way, so there's a pot of money that can immediately be accessed. And if it goes over that, then they come back and get another authorization. So Dr. Schatz and I uh, have put together a bill that uh, one, waives these contracting requirements for that immediate period, so you can actually deploy people. And secondly, uh, based upon, and Dr. Cadillac, this is where you nailed it, upon the previous 14 years of public health emergencies, we take the travel, we take the average of that expenditure, and we make those dollars available up front to be immediately drawn down. Still accountability. Uh, GAO is going to do a report, make sure that the CDC hasn't used it to go to Hawaii for a, a conference as opposed to Africa to fight Ebola. Uh, no offense, Dr. Reddit. Uh, but still, the point being that we would, we would have the accountability built in, but we think it's a good bill. Now, let me move on to something different. Dr. Redd, I was struck speaking to people after Zika hit that in retrospect, and of course everything in retrospect, if I could do things in retrospect, I'd be a millionaire on the stock market. But in retrospect, you could have kind of predicted what was going to happen because supposedly Brazil was flying in folks from the South Pacific to work on their Olympic stadiums that 
Zika had been breaking out in the South Pacific where these workers were coming from. Brazil is like a Petri dish for Zika, and you could have predicted it. Now, of course, it's retrospective. But the thought occurs to me with big data, we can actually put in travel patterns. We can put in areas of receptivity. We can put in where there are outbreaks and make some at least first blush guess as to where the next epidemic is going to be. Uh, is that just me sort of, um, wouldn't it be great sort of thing? Or is this something practical? And if it's practical, is CDC doing it? Um, I agree with your overall statement. I think another way of looking at this is that the, the pathway that Zika followed was very similar to chikungunya just a few years before where it existed in the Pacific was, and then caused big outbreaks in, uh, in Brazil and in uh, South America. Uh, another, another point that is the same is um, when we had outbreaks in the Caribbean, we knew um, locations of lots of travel to the U.S. and where the vector was uh, the, the 80s Egypti mosquito lived. It's the same place that we've seen uh, small dinghy outbreaks in the past. So can we use this predictively? Because if we could use it predictively, if we could see, uh, well, Brazilians are going to be having this problem. Let's go down there and encourage them to spray for mosquitoes, et well, cetera. I think it's hard to do that. I think, I think that the, um, the vector uh, is very resilient, and there were some questions. Now, I'm not, I was just giving the example of spraying the mosquitoes as a concrete action, but what I'm asking not about is the vector of resilient. Can we use big data just to look at travel patterns where there's an outbreak and guess where there might be a spread of such an outbreak? I think we can. I think the challenge is what do you do with that information and is there a way to use that, for example, to have prevented the Zika outbreak in, uh, in Miami-Dade County? Um, I, th I think that the things that you do... To so you're ahead of us. What you use with the information is different than if you can actually acquire the information if it's, if it's practical and right, if you will, to acquire mm -hmm. the information, are we putting such systems in place? Well, there, just to take the Zika example, there was a lot of communication with Texas and Florida, uh, Louisiana, the Gulf Coast areas that have the, um, the, the 80s Egypti mosquito recognizing that. Okay, now I'm, you're, you're still after me because that's after it hit Brazil and after we knew that there was going to be travel from Brazil up. I'm actually trying to go proactively before that in that we could see the Brazilians were bringing in lots of workers from the South Pacific, and therefore it was predictable that whatever was breaking out there was going to break out here. Now that is taking the battle to the enemy, if you will. Are we doing that? Do we have a worldwide kind of map, and I've seen such a map of hot spots of infectious diseases, overlaid with travel patterns to guess whether or not, there, and I understand CDC has worldwide outposts, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm asking something more kind of closer to the point sure. than whether it gets to Texas. I, I think the quality of information is, is variable. I don't think we have the same, for example, I think the inflammation we have about influenza is much better than we have about all the vector-borne, all the mosquito-borne diseases that are out there where we know uh, what viruses are circulating in China because of the, the known importance of influenza and the risk it poses for a, uh, a global pandemic. Now, I have seen maps, though, and I'm over time, and I'll stop after this, but I have seen maps put out by CDC and World Health in which it shows, oh, yeah, here is this and there is that, and it's a hot spot of a particular virus. Um, can that not be, again, overlaid with travel patterns? Well, there are parts of the world that the, some of the discussion earlier about the, um, the number of zoonotic diseases that are detected that uh, cause uh, infections in humans. There are certain parts of the world that are more prone to, the, to those emergences. Um, and your question is, how do we use that information? Um, we certainly do have travel maps of where, where people travel to and from. Uh, we have information about where various diseases uh, occur at uh, variable disease degrees of granularity. Um, and I think those two things do go together. I think it, how we would use that to take a preemptive action is really the, I think that's the question that you're getting at. Okay, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, incredibly informative. Thank you to all of the witnesses. Um, I want to raise... Uh, two concerns uh, that I have uh, emanating from conversations uh, I've had with companies in Connecticut that operate in the pandemic response field. The first is um, 
regarding uh, response to an influenza uh, outbreak, and this is either, either for Dr. Cadlick, I think, or Dr. Red. Um, Dr. Cadlick, in your testimony, you write that we have sufficient domestic vaccine manufacturing capacity to produce bulk vaccine for every American within six months. Um, but I want to ask either of you um, about the question of vaccine delivery. Um, and, and this comes from conversations with a manufacturer in Connecticut, BD, which is one of the bigger syringe manufacturers. Um, and my understanding is that if you needed to get vaccine to everybody, you need about 600 million drug delivery devices. Now, BD is one of the biggest manufacturers, but it'd take them six years to do 600 million units. So um, what, what are our um, thoughts on preparation to make sure that we not only have the right amount of vaccine, but the right amount of vaccine delivery devices? Well, thank you, sir. That That is one of the issues in the end-to-end -end problem set that has to be addressed, quite frankly. Uh, and I have my director from BARDA if he wants to make a comment, if he, he's welcome to do at this point. But I think part of the strategy we're, we're looking at also is how do we can, how can we innovate and either have better delivery devices or specifically can we make better vaccines that only require one dose? Remember, the 600 million doses is for two per person. And then the third thing is, is there are maybe new vaccine technologies that allow you to do it orally or intranasally or a variety of other means besides subcutaneously with a needle. So I think those, all those issues are being kind of evaluated and pursued. Uh, but yes, that there, there are some very significant shortfalls in terms of, uh, and there are other disposables as well that are a matter of concern when you get into that kind of uh, circumstance. Rick, do you have any? Dr. Red, any thoughts? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Do you... That's all right. No, I just want to make sure if, if I left something out, Dr. Bright could offer it. So I think this is a modeling problem, and particularly from the, um, the supply standpoint, making sure that we are tapping into the existing commercial market and we're able to leverage that system um, in addition to stockpiling what that market can't produce. Um, Dr. Cadlick, back to you on my second concern. Um, BARDA, you know, as we've talked about, is such a wonderful model and working with industry, uh, you've developed 34 approved medical countermeasures, 23 influenza vaccines. Um, again, coming back to a company that BARDA has worked with in Connecticut Protein Sciences, which as you may know has um, come up with uh, an innovative way to d d develop a vaccine, not the traditional egg-based vaccine, but a recombinant DNA uh, technology mechanism. Um, they've raised the issue of how you make sure that having spent the money to develop these vaccines, there's a market so that they can uh, continue to develop processes and make sure that they're available. Um, what's the responsibility of BART or, or HHS, or uh, I guess if CDC wants to weigh in, um, on how you make sure that the money being spent on research um, ends up in a marketable vaccine uh, and that you're working with companies to make sure that uh, a bridge market Market exists so that they're available in the case that you need them for a pandemic? Well, clearly that's one of the factors that goes into this public-private partnership, and, and I would also invite Dr. Gottlieb, because it, it has been the case with the PRVs, like with the vouchers, if you get through that, you can get some benefits, but we need to look at the whole variety of incentives to not only get, into, get companies into the market, but keep them in the market and keep them viable going forward. Uh, there is this issue of the second valley of death which has been raised at some point in time that once you've delivered your vaccine and, and if you don't get either the opportunity to replenish it or use that technology for some other commercial uh, purpose that the company may still be at risk and you may still uh, basically be confronted with the, uh, the, the limitations that you, have, that you don't have the producer. Uh, so these are issues that are still pretty thorny and quite frankly, uh, that's one of the areas I think that probably deserve a little more consideration during your reauthorization. I don't mean to keep Dr. Gottlieb out of this conversation. You raised this in some of your earlier testimony, some of the market disincentives uh, here. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I think you raise a very, a very valid point, Senator. I, I, you know, if you're talking about a, a countermeasure that doesn't necessarily have a dual use for another public health application, your only market's going to be um, in preparedness, and, and presumably the only market's going to be for stockpiling, and if it's not something that turns over a lot, so you're not going to have, have to constantly replenish the stockpile, 
it, depending on what you're developing, the um, you know the the cost of capital to try to develop that product might not. Be, might be too high to uh, to justify the investment. I saw this when I was on the other side of this other side of this equation. We've tried to offset some of that with the PRVs, but I will prefer, I will say that the value of the PRVs in the marketplace have diminished as we've had more PRVs. So the the value of that incentive has also gone down over time. So I think this is something we should all contemplate. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the discussion here this morning. And uh, Dr. Cadillac, uh, you, you uh, recognized in response to Senator Warren's question that uh, the challenge that Puerto Rico uh, faced after the, the devastating hurricane, I mean, it's difficult in an island area where you're not connected, where you're remote. Well, that brings it close home to me. We're not an island in Alaska, but we're not connected to the continental um, United States. And we are really big, and we don't have a lot of roads. Uh, it was just about 75, 78 years ago that uh, we had a diphtheria outbreak in Nome. And we were able to deliver the serum by dog sled. We're not doing that anymore, thankfully. But it does speak to the reality of, of how you respond when you do have an, an outbreak and uh, your, your ability to, uh, to move in quickly is limited um, either because of, of weather or just access limitations. And uh, we were reminded of this at 9-11 when all the airspace is shut down. Well, you now have 80% of your communities that have no way to get things in and out. Uh, a major earthquake that can take out the, the, a major port that serves uh, access or, or, or airports. And so for, for us, particularly in Alaska, we've, we've had to be our own little island when it comes to response. But when you're trying to get stockpiles of, of vaccines or the like. That makes it very, very challenging. Now, I think, I, I don't recall whether it was you, Dr. Cadillac, or, or, or Admiral Red, uh, mentioned that you can get stockpiles, I believe, of vaccines anywhere in the United States within 12 hours. Did I hear that correctly? And so, should I be worried in a, in a, in a small, remote, um, not accessible by, by road, uh, shut out by weather. I mean, we can't, we can't even get a state trooper in for three days into, into certain of our villages at, at certain points in time. What, what can you do to assure me that we can be that responsive in our more rural areas? That's one part of the question. The other part is when it comes to, to infrastructure itself. Uh, several years back, we had the first uh, sizable cruise ship going through the Arctic. We had all kinds of, of emergency preparation drills, and it was not because we were most fearful of, of an oil spill uh, from a ship that might hit the ice, but an issue on the ship where you now have 500 passengers who need some level of health care, and there's no health care facilities to be had in, in the region. So for purposes of, of how we can be responsive um, when there is a public health crisis, whether it's an outbreak or some kind of a disaster, man-made, natural, or otherwise, what assurances can you give us from these rural states? And I'll, I'll turn to Dr. Cadillac and, and you, Admiral. Well, thank you, ma'am. Um, that is a challenge. I think the, the reality is the strategic national stockpile can get anywhere to be delivered to the state authorities within 12 hours. So it, that would get to our, our To Anchorage or, or, for example. And then it's really the state's responsibilities to basically get those products or those vaccines or drugs to the last terminal mile to those people who need them. And that is a th an issue that Quite frankly, I think Asper and the CDC share concern that that's an area where um, concerted work has to be done uh, because there are other places in the country that probably would have Same similar thing. challenges. Mm -hmm. Admiral Red, do you want to? Uh, yes, I, I think this is a very, uh, very challenging scenario. And I think that if it were a challenge to move product to a location, there would be other challenges as well. Um, understanding the the 
problem of the disease in that location. We might have telecommunication, but the access to laboratories, access to uh, epidemiologic investigation, those would also be things that would be limited. So I think this is probably um, needs to be thought of as a broader, a broader set of uh, capabilities that are needed to assure the protection of these populations, uh, not just the stockpile, but medical care and really uh, situational awareness as to what's happening in those locations. Well, and it is something, of course, that, that we clearly think about. The last thing I'm going to leave you with, the state of Alaska just conducted uh, an Alaska health impact assessment, uh, and it was a framework based on the current national climate assessment predictions and the impact to Alaska as a state that is seeing the impact of climate change as warming temperatures. You might not feel it here in, in the East Coast, but it's warmer back home. And uh, it outlines some of the potential health effects uh, that could be coming our way several decades out. We recognize that. But one of the concerns, of course, is, is vector-borne, um, or excuse me, infectious diseases uh, that, that are, are particularly asso associated with vector-borne. Usually we're able to, to freeze those nasty mosquitoes and they, they can't uh, uh, move these, these levels of, of outbreaks. But it is something that as we think about public health emergencies, we're so focused on the here and the now and the disaster of the day, but I do think it's important that we be, uh, we be thinking long-term about the changes that might be headed our direction. Thank you, Senator Murkowski. Senator Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and once again, thank you for your kind welcome to this committee. Um, kind of following up on, I think Senator Casey may have highlighted and Senator Murkowski was talking about the rural health areas. Um, it, I, I can understand the, the, the challenges when there's a pandemic and you need to get access. But, you know, I've got a state that's also very rural, but we've got roads. We've got the ability to get serum in and things like that, but yet we're in Tornado Alley. We're in Hurricane Alley. It comes through. And so my concern is the preparedness for health care delivery on an immediate basis when you have those disasters. Because in Alabama, like so many other states, rural health care is disappearing. And that's a real challenge. So I'd like to address, uh, have you address um, what's being thought about, what's being done to prepare for those type of emergencies for those communities who are not have the daily health care that they've got so that, that immediate health care needs can be uh, given to them. Dr. Sir, I would just say uh, one of the areas I touched in my uh, written testimony is on this idea of creating a national disaster health care system, really taking advantage of the, 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 the nascent trauma system that we have in our country that uh, clearly needs to be amalgamated or, if you will, kind of unified. We would like to basically use the hospital preparedness program as a means to do that. It certainly would need more resources to do that, but basically create, expand the regional co uh, coalitions to, to not only cover states but regions, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, that, that part of the, the country uh, where you can actually share resources uh, and basically do better coordination, mutual aid in those kinds of situations, build the kind of relationships where you know about bed availability, work with the EMS systems in terms of transportation to basically identify the appropriate places to take people with different injuries or different kind of casualties uh, to the right place to ensure their survival. Uh, so there's a lot that can be done, and, and quite frankly, uh, we think by regionalizing this will help uh, because in some, Alabama has a few major cities, Mobile, um, clearly there are some great uh, facilities there, as well as other parts of the state, as well as adjacent parts in Mississippi. If you can build that coalition on a regional basis, you can probably address some, but not all of those issues. It's a little bit beyond preparedness, but um, one of the things that we've done at CDC is um, examine uh, rural health and the 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 way that we've done that as a first step is to actually examine the data that we have. And there are a series of publications on issues um, related to rural health in our, our uh, in-house journal, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. And we, we'd be happy to get those to you to kind of yeah. define, the, define the problem. Okay, that'd be great. Um, I'm also what was going to ask a similar question about uh, citizens with dis disabilities. Uh, do you have specific guidelines, things that you do with you and, and to take care of those 
uh, with disabilities, whether it's a physical disability, a mental disability, or, or whatever. Sir, uh, we have a program at HHS in, in the ASPR that basically uses CMS data, Medicare data, to basically identify people in different regions or in states uh, by zip code, by home address, even by phone number, to identify people who are dependent on durable medical equipment. So uh, in advance of a hurricane, for example, uh, we provide to states, like in the case of Florida, and I believe in Alabama, two prior to uh, Norm, before that hit, um, that we identified people who would be at risk to power outages or who would need probably special assistance if they needed to be evacuated. Um, and that's one piece of the problem. problem. Quite frankly, uh, we don't have that uh, data for Medicaid from individual states, so that would be another way to enhance that if we could get data on that. But that's just one way to, to basically pre-identify people at risk, um, and it goes a long way to basically take care, care of folks. Maybe just three sure. quick things. Uh, we require our uh, state grantees to include a section on uh, vulnerable populations uh, in their emergency response plans. So that, that's one thing. Um, the second is that we, um, we work with professional associations. Pr predominant, I'm thinking more of uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, when there is an emergency to make sure that we're addressing those populations. Um, also, when we um, activate our operations center for an emergency response, there is a, a functional desk on vulnerable populations to, to try to deal with those, those the kinds of issues that come up. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Jones. Senator Casey, do you have any uh, questions or concluding remarks you'd like to make? Mr. Chairman, just some concluding remarks, and I'll read through them quickly. I want to thank our witnesses, obviously, for their insights and expertise today and their ongoing work uh, as part of the federal government to develop and maintain the necessary public health preparedness capabilities. I'll have some questions for the record uh, in addition to the ones I asked already. Ne next week, we look forward to hearing from non-governmental stakeholders about how we can continue to strengthen our readiness for future public health emergencies and keep the American public safe. As we heard today, preparedness is continuous. It must evolve to face new and different types of threats. I remain committed to ensuring we sustain the progress we've already made in preparing for public health emergencies, which, uh, or I should say, while continuing to work to anticipate the next threat. We've got a strong bipartisan history of working together on this committee to improve our community's ability to respond to all manner of public health threats, and I look forward to continuing that tradition in the months ahead. And Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your work on this, as well as uh, Ranking Member Murray and Senator Burr, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Casey, Senator Casey is exactly right. This is uh, one of the many areas this committee has effectively worked on, uh, both in the authorization and reauthorization of, of legislation to prepare our country for the unexpected disaster that might, might occur to us. A lot of progress has been made. I want to thank Senator Casey and Senator Burr especially for their leadership over the years in this area. Uh, as he indicated, we'll be having our second hearing on this topic next Tuesday, January 23rd, working with Senator Murray, Senator Casey, Senator Burr, and others. We hope to be able to write legislation uh, revisiting uh, this act and uh, mark it up in committee this spring and present it to the Senate for bipartisan action. So I thank the witnesses for coming today. Uh, the testimony has been very helpful. The attendance has been good. Uh, the hearing record will remain open for 10 days. Members may submit additional information within that time if they would like. Uh, our committee will meet again tomorrow on a different topic at 10 a.m. for a hearing entitled Reauthorizing the Higher Education Act, Financial Aid Simplification and Transparency. We've been working for more than four years on taking a new look at the federal government's relationship to our colleges and universities, there's 6,000 of them. Uh, our major role is that we appropriate uh, about $34, $5 billion a year in grants for students to attend colleges. And there are more than $100 billion of new student loans each year. And in connection with all of that money, 
Um, there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of need for us to take a look at accreditation, innovation, simplification, getting through the jungle of red tape, another whole set of, uh, uh, of activities. That will be our major focus during this uh, year. And we hope also to have that bipartisan legislation to the Senate floor uh, sometime this spring. Uh, thank you for being here today. The committee will stand adjourned.